Hi everyone, I am Stan Lasek and welcome to this talk on Bayesian evidence synthesis using the Base Combo R package. I won't talk much about Bayesian methods and will assume you are familiar with the idea of a prior distribution and a posterior distribution. Let me start by uh, motivating what this package does and the problem that it solves with um, a, a particular problem. So assume we have a hypothesis which is, um, is a new drug effective for depression? So perhaps we've devel developed this drug and we're interested um, in trying it out now in uh, clinical trials. So we have one study which is a two group between subjects design. So this is a, a randomized controlled trial where some patients receive a placebo drug and some receive our new drug. Uh, the drug is dosed at 50 milligrams and our patient population consists of moderately depressed patients. And then our outcome variable is the back depression inventory. Then for our second study, it's also a two group uh, study, but it's a crossover design. So this means that patients receive both the placebo for a period of time and the drug. And uh, halfway through the study, uh, they, they switch over. Half receive the placebo first, and then the drug. The other half receive the drug first, and then after a washout period, uh, get the placebo. So this is a, a within subjects design, where study one was a between subjects design. Um, for study two, they're dosed at 80 milligrams, so higher than the first study. And this is in severely depressed patients, so it's a different patient population as well. The outcome is heart rate variability, which is a physiological biomarker. Uh, of depression and people that are depressed tend to have a lower heart rate durability compared to healthy controls. And of course we can imagine these studies differing on other dimensions as well. Uh, perhaps study one was conducted in the UK and study two was conducted in Japan. And we want to combine the results of these studies to test our hypotheses, uh, but they, they really are quite different and that's the, the problem. So the parameters which are the effect sizes that we calculate in these studies um, it, it's hard to argue that they're really measuring the same thing or the same underlying effect, uh, which is what a, a standard meta-analysis meta would assume. And there's always some debate in the meta-analysis literature with how similar the, the effect sizes or the inputs have to be uh, for it to be a viable approach. So here I've used this fictitious example to make things very different, where I think most people would agree that coming up with a common parameter and um, assuming that it's sort of consistent across the studies even with a random effects meta-analysis meta uh, is not appropriate. So what can we do? One solution is based on this paper uh, that came out in 2012. And it's a, the idea is to combine the results at the level of the hypothesis and not at the level of the parameter like a normal meta-analysis would do. And uh, this uh, paper did have some R code with it, uh, but it wasn't very user friendly. Um, so myself and a colleague rewrote the, all of the code from scratch, uh, made it into nice functions and into an R package uh, that has an easier user interface uh, so we could try out uh, this approach a little more easily. But all of the intellectual work um, in terms of the methodology came from this paper. So the way it works is we first start with uh, some hypotheses, a set of uh, mutually exclusive and uh, exhaustive hypotheses and uh, put a prior probability distribution over them. So our hypotheses are only three so the first one is that the effect size is less than zero. Uh, this is h less than zero here. Uh, that the effect size is exactly zero or that the effect size is greater than zero. And we could of course have a, a different distribution over what we think is initially plausible, but this is a, a good approach to start, especially as we're accumulating multiple studies over time. Um, this is a, a good default setting. Then the second step is to come up with a prior for our parameter. And this is a little bit confusing because we have two priors here. So this is a prior for our effect size. Um, I'll, I'll use theta throughout uh, to refer to the effect size. So we have a prior over that in addition to a prior over a hypothesis. And uh, what this is saying, it's a, we're modeling our prior as a normal distribution. And this is saying that um, effect sizes less than minus three or greater than positive three are uh, very unlikely. Then we take our data and analyze it. And uh, what we get from that is a, a likelihood. And this is independent of uh, prior, so uh, nothing amazing about this. Uh, but what it does tell us is, given the data, what values of the parameter uh, our effect size are more plausible and which ones are less plausible. So we can see here that the distribution is shifted to the right towards uh, positive values. And uh, large negative values are very unlikely uh, given the data uh, that we've seen. Then the next step is to combine the likelihood and the prior to calculate a base factor. And if you're not familiar with the base factor, you can think of it as um, a likelihood ratio. It's very similar to that. 
And uh, what it tells us is which uh, hypotheses are better supported uh, by the data. And we can see here that uh, given our likelihood tells us that the, the data has said that positive values are more plausible, uh, we can see that reflected here in the base factor where I, our hypothesis of a positive effect size or one that has positive values uh, becomes much higher compared to other uh, hypotheses that assume no, uh, an effect size of zero or a negative uh, effect size. Uh, base factors are a bit, um, it takes some getting used to and they're not really intuitive for many people. So we can convert this back to a probability scale by combining what we calculated from the base factor uh, and our prior probability uh, over the hypotheses. And finally, what we get then, and this is sort of the, the end of the analysis uh, for a single study, is a posterior probability over our hypotheses. And we can see here that the hypothesis of a positive effect size is much more supported compared to the other hypotheses. And the y-axis is now on the probability scale. So it's about uh, 80% or a probability of 0.8 uh, that given the data, our um, effect size is, is uh, greater than zero. Now, uh, as I said, this is for one study and to now accumulate evidence or combine evidence across multiple studies, uh, we just essentially repeat the same procedure um, where we come up with a new likelihood based on each data set. Uh, the only difference is when we go around for the second time, we don't start off with this initial hypothesis of uh, being equally likely. Uh, we take our posterior from the first analysis and this becomes then the prior for the second analysis and so on. Then once we do that uh, second round through the data, our posterior for that becomes the prior for the third round and so on. And you just keep iterating until you uh, analyze all of your data sets. And then ideally at the end, you'll have one hypothesis that uh, clearly dominates the, the other ones. So um, I put this slide here just to get some intuition of how that uh, base factor is uh, calculated and it's uh, fairly straightforward. So the distribution at the top is the prior density, uh, which I had on the previous slide. And I've just divided it into uh, regions of uh, negative values. So this is region A, a region of positive values, C, and then the height of the curve. So this isn't a region, it's just a point uh, at uh, zero. And then once we've analyzed the data and combined our prior for likelihood, uh, we get this posterior density. And because our data said that the values were likely to be positive, we see this shifted a bit towards the right. So the, the area F here gets uh, larger and the area D gets smaller. And then to calculate our base factors, it's uh, just taking uh, ratios of areas here. So for example, if we wanted to calculate um, the, the base factor for the hypothesis that the effect size is greater than zero, it's just the area of region F over the area of region C. And then same thing for the, the first hypothesis here, it's the area of D over A. And then the slight twist is calculating the base factor for the hypothesis of uh, the effect size being exactly zero. So this isn't an area, it's the height of the curve of, at point E here, and then the height of the curve over point B, and it's that ratio uh, that you use for that calculation. So the, the math itself is uh, fairly straightforward and simple uh, to calculate these once you get um, have these distributions. So let's turn to some data now. So this is uh, fictitious data. The first study has the Beck depression inventory on the y-axis and uh, each point is one patient. Uh, lower scores are better here and we can see that uh, those in the drug condition on average have slightly lower values. So it's suggested that uh, there might be an effect. Uh, for study two, it's heart rate variability plotted on the y-axis and higher values are better. And uh, this is plotted differently because you may recall this is a crossover design. So a patient was both off the drug, so in the placebo, but then also on the drug at another time period as well. And most of these lines are sloping upwards. So again, suggesting that uh, it's there's an improvement when they're on the drug versus off the drug. So the first step in this whole process is to just analyze those two data sets with a, a regular analysis. And we can do that with the LM function. So for the first study, we're just modeling the back depression inventory value uh, as a function of drug, which is just a, an indicator variable. And we get an estimate for the drug effect, minus 0.815, and a standard error. And it's these two values that we need for the Bayesian evidence combination. So we can just take these values and uh, plug them into another equation later on. Uh, the p-value here isn't uh, significant, but it's tending towards uh, sort of the, the smaller side. For the second study, we're modeling heart rate variability uh, we're including a subject effect now to account for the paired nature of the data and then of course including the drug effect as well. Um, this um, is a simple model. Likely we would want to use a slightly more complex model for our crossover design, uh, perhaps having subject as a random effect and so on. 
uh, but just for the illustrative purposes, I've kept it a very simple. And here we get another estimate of the drug effect and also the standard error for that. And this p-value uh, does happen to be uh, just fairly significant. So it's these four blue data points that we then take forward into further analysis. So now we turn to functionality in the Bayes combo package. And the first function is a PPH, so a posterior probability for a hypothesis. And we just feed in our uh, effect size estimate that we calculated and then the standard error for that as well. Uh, one slight twist is that um, the effect size was negative that we actually calculated because uh, being on the drug was associated with uh, a better outcome. Uh, and one thing that I did here, which is common also in the meta-analysis, is that you want all of your effects go um, that is a, a good effect going in the same direction. Uh, so here I just dropped the minus sign. Uh, so we assume that a positive value means a, a good effect of the drug. And uh, we run that analysis and then we can uh, you know, plot the results. And here, this is our uh, posterior probability of our hypotheses, uh, the, the end of the, the first uh, loop through that cycle, where we can see that the probability of a positive effect size is uh, about 75% or so if uh, we read it off the graph. So there's some evidence that the, the drug works, but um, not uh, super strong. And we can also plot the results. So there's a plot function defined uh, for the outcome of that. And that gives you this graph here where you have a plot of the prior in gray. And this is the default prior that's uh, chosen by that function. Then we also have the likelihood, which is the data, the dotted line here. And that's uh, purely driven by the data. And then finally, we get the posterior distribution as the black line, which is a compromise between those two. And uh, this posterior, we can extract the, the mean and the, the standard deviation of that, uh, which are within this uh, results uh, one uh, object. And we can get those uh, values if you need them. So we can do the same analysis for 32, uh, just feed in the um, estimated effect size and the standard error. Uh, and there are a bunch of other uh, options here for this function, which for now I'm not uh, discussing. And you, again, you can plot the results of that. And uh, not surprising, the probability that the effect size is positive has the most support, uh, maybe about 90% or so we get um, for that hypothesis. So um, that's great. This is analyzing one study at a time, but we want to analyze them all together and sort of accumulate all of these effects. So the e easiest way to do that is use the evidence combination function, where we just feed in those uh, estimated effect sizes and the standard errors as vectors. And uh, we can then plot the result. And here we have, again, the probability of the hypothesis on the y-axis. And now the x-axis is the number of studies. So we start off at study zero. This is our prior probability where all of the hypotheses are equal. And we can see that after the first study, the hypothesis of a positive effect size here in red uh, is increased. And then after the second study, it's further increased as well. And then the hypotheses of the other studies decrease. And of course, if you had more studies, uh, you know, you would just have them further to right here. And ideally, one line would clearly dominate the others, and you'd have a, a very strong uh, support for one hypothesis or, or another. Uh, another function that you can use is the, the force plot. Uh, you just call it on the result of that analysis. And here, the effect size is on the x-axis. The gray bar is the prior, uh, prior distribution, and the black point here is our estimated uh, effect size that we put into the model, as well as the, um, the uncertainty based on the standard error. So it gives you a feel for how the, the prior is relating to the effect sizes. And there is also an option to uh, scale uh, the effect sizes. So if what you're inputting is on uh, very different uh, measurement units, uh, it might be hard to visualize it with a force plot so you can standardize it so uh, they're, they're more compared. Now, with a Bayesian analysis, one of the big questions is the, the prior itself and how do you specify a good value for that? Um, there is an argument here where you can specify a prior uh, for each study just by another vector of arguments. Uh, but what's easier to do sometimes is to use this a standard error multiplier where it takes the default priors, which are calculated here uh, based on a, a rule of thumb that uh, was in that publication, and just say, well, I just want to double it, multiply it by two. And you can see the effect of that in the graph here where the gray prior distributions are now twice as wide as they were in the previous graph. And this is a good way to, uh, good way to perform a sensitivity analysis uh, where you can double this or quadruple it or half it and uh, see how the results change based on, on your prior. Uh, one other option that uh, you can consider using is instead of specifying a point null hypothesis, so that's what we've been doing in the past, uh, we had the one hypothesis of 
being exactly zero, uh, you can have an interval or a range hypothesis where you say there's some region around zero um, that for practical purposes is um, close enough to zero that I'll consider it uh, no effect. And you can specify that here with this uh, H0 argument. And you just give it a vector of two arguments, the, the lower value uh, around zero and the upper value around zero to say um, within that, I'll consider it actually uh, similar enough to zero. And you can see that you get slightly different results. So with the point null, our leaving hypothesis of a positive effect size is 0.95, whereas with the interval, it's a 0.99. And I would recommend using an interval hypothesis most of the time, um, partly because the point null, it's slightly unusual in that you're comparing areas uh, under a curve and then also comparing uh, the height of the curve. And it, it's a little bit of an apples and oranges thing, I find. Uh, whereas with the interval null, you're always comparing areas under the curve. Uh, and that makes uh, a little bit more sense. And I think the results are a little bit more intuitive as well. And that if you look at the, the numeric results here, um, probably the, the result of this analysis is closer to a probability of 0.99 with 0.95. Uh, because you may recall that uh, the second study was already significant on its own. And the first study was still uh, you know, providing evidence for an effect. So it seems that 0.95 is maybe not quite strong enough um, for what you would expect intuitively. Whereas with the interval null, uh, you get a, a stronger, uh, stronger result. It may not happen in every case, but at least with the, this data set, uh, it sort of conforms to intuition a bit more. And I just wanted to dwell a little bit more on a point nulls um, because they can be a little bit, um, little bit dangerous, I would say. So here I'm analyzing the results of study one and the graph on the left uses the standard prior with the, the standard error multiplier of set to one and the graph on the right uh, is identical except the standard error multiplier set to two. So we're using a broader, more uncertain prior. And you can see that in the graphs here. Uh, the graph on the left with the gray line is the prior and the graph on the right also has a gray line which is much, uh, much wider and less peaked, representing less uncertainty. And uh, you may recall the way that we calculated the base factor for this uh, was the height of uh, two points on the curve, uh, at the effect size zero. Um, so if you look at the graph on the left, you can see that the, the height of the curve for the blue line, which is the posterior, so after we've conditioned on the data, is lower than the value of the prior. So what this is telling us is that the, the, given the data, um, an effect size of zero is less plausible than it was before we saw the data. Um, if we look at the other one, uh, we see that the points are on top of each other, uh, even though the, the data is the same. Um, and the data is uh, you know, shifting that blue curve towards the right because uh, the data suggested positive effect sizes were, uh, were more likely. Um, it didn't change the, the result of our um, hypothesis for a null effect. And this is slightly counterintuitive because you're thinking, well, okay, this prior distribution contained less information. Um, so therefore the posterior should reflect the effect of the data more uh, and should be shifted more to the right. Um, but it doesn't always happen that way. And indeed, it's hard to tell on these graphs, but the distri blue distribution on the right is shifted a little bit more compared to the blue distribution on the left, uh, but it's also slightly wider uh, as well. And you can sort of uh, tell that. So these results tend to be a little bit counterintuitive um, and the results that you get are very dependent on the prior that you specify when you have this point null. Uh, so for that reason, I, I tend not to use these and would recommend using an interval null. And oh, here's just a reference line so you can compare uh, the, the results across uh, the two graphs. So as a summary, so this approach can be used to combine a diverse data, uh, but you need to uh, think very carefully about your priors if you're using the point null approach, um, as that has a big effect on the base factors and then on the subsequent uh, calculations. Um, so I've tended not to use it myself in the end. Um, it didn't, in terms of what I initially wanted it for, but uh, if you do have diverse data and you're thinking maybe a meta-analysis is not appropriate, um, this might be something else that uh, you could consider. Uh, so this package is up on uh, CRAM and it's also on GitHub if you want to uh, download it. And um, also I'd like to thank uh, Bruno who helped uh, convert uh, some of that uh, R code and, and help uh, create this package. So I uh, thank you for your attention.